Shalom everyone, hope everyone's doing well. Zat Hashem, today in Mesechet Sanhedrin, we're going to learn Yedzayin Amur Aleph, 17a. We're going to start the second to last line on Tedzayin Amur Bet, uh, Sanhedrin Gedol Haita. going to have two sections in today's learning. The first section, we're going to clarify the sources for the debate we had in the Mishnah, which is the size of the Sanhedrin Hagdola. According to the Tanakama, it's 71. According to Rabbi Yehuda, it was 70. We'll find the sources for that. And then the second section, in a related discussion, we'll discuss the story of Eldad Umeidad, which is a fascinating story and a lot of insights that we can derive from this story as well. As always, our learning should be a zechut, a merit for a fuash lema, a full and speedy recovery for Yaakov ben Dina. And we should only hear besorot tovot. Zat Hashem. So let's get started. Bottom of Tetzayin Mabet 16b, the bottom of the page. At the two dots, Sanhedrin Gdolaita. So we had a machloket in the Mishnah. Mishnah back on Bet and Aleph, we had a machloket is what is the size of the Supreme Court of Judaism, the Sanhedrin Gdola? The Tanakhama, the Chachamim in the Mishnah said it's 71, and Rabbi Huda said it was 70. This debate is contingent on the original Sanhedrin that was formulated in the days of Moshe Rabbeinu, which were 70 people. It's actually in Parashat Baha'u'llah Techa. And the Psukim there discuss how, after different incidences that uh, Tavera specifically, the courts that were set up, um, the 70 that was set up to assist Moshe prior were destroyed. And Moshe complains to Hashem he needs assistance. So Hashem says to gather 70 elders. Now these 70 elders, we're going to see, they eventually do join Moshe in helping to guide him with the people. So the debate really is, is Moshe considered part of that group? I.e., is it one group of 71? Or is Moshe not, and therefore it's only 70, and this would be the precedent, like Rabbi Yehuda, that the Sanhedrin Dola, the great Sanhedrin, is only 70 members. So the Gemara says like this, My time at Drabanan, last line of the page. Tedzayin would bet. My time at Drabanan, Damri, Umoshal Gabeyen. What is the reasoning of the Rabbanan who say that Moshe is on top of them, meaning to say that he's part of the Sanhedrin? And therefore, he's considered 71. There's 71 members of the Sanhedrin. So the Gemara says, Amar Kra, because the Pasuk says in there, it says, the Yatsvu Sham Imach. They will stand there with you. So to Rabbanan say, why does it say they will stand there with you? The emphasis in the Psukim is these 70 will be imbued with uh, the ability to lead along with you, the Tashchina. They're going to stand there with you near the Ohel Moed and they're going to help guide the people. So what's the emphasis of Imach? Imach ve'at ba'adayu. With you means 70 plus you, you will be together with them, meaning that it's a group of 71 in conglomerate so as to show that the Sanhedrin Gedola was actually 71 members. Rabbi Yudah, Rabbi Yudah says back, that's not what we use Imach to teach us. Rather, Imach Mishum Shechina. Rather, Imach is to emphasize with you because of the Shechina. So Rashi has two Pshatim. The first Pshat Rashi says is, although they will join you, they have to stand outside of the Ohel Moed, meaning you could stand within the Ohel Moed, the place where you, Hashem's presence was revealed, but they're going to stand outside of you. So they'll stand with you, but not exactly together with you. So the emphasis in the verse then is not to compare them and say that he's part of the Sanhedrin making it 71, rather that they stand with you, but outside of the tent because of the honor of the Shekhinah that was inside. So therefore that's not a source of 71, Rabbanan, the Rabbanan respond, and they say, okay, fine, I'll give you a different source. Amar Kra, the Pasuk says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Moshe, V'nas'u itach b'masa ha'am. They will bear with you the burden of the people. Again, emphasis of with you is itach ve'at ba'adayu. You, with you, and you are with them. Again, to emphasize that it was one unit of 71. Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda says back, that's not a proof, because itach b'domim lecha. Actually, Itach teaches you that they have to be domin to you. What does it mean they have to be comparable to you? So Rashi explains it means that the people that are to be, are to be selected for this Sanhedrin Dola, they have to be miuchasin u They have to have 
pure lineage and also have to be uh, blemish free. Sounds like physical blemishes. So that's the emphasis of Itach. Not to say it's one unit of 71, but rather that they have to be like you with great Ichlis and also blemish free. So the Gemara says, Rabbanan, the Rabbanan say back, I don't need that verse to teach me that drasha because it says, me, itach nafka. The Rabbanan say back is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, this is back in, in actually in Parashat Yitro, I believe. Parashat Yitro, one second. This is back in Parashat Yitro. Shmot Yitchet. Yeah. Is that when Yitro assists Moshe and he tells him, look, you need to arrange a group of judges. So there, Moshe Rabbeinu is told by Yitro, They will make it easier for you, because as Yitro saw, it was too much of a burden for Moshe to judge the Jewish people by himself, and they will bear with you. So Yat Nafka, that's where he learns out, says the Rabbanan, the idea that they have to be blemish-free and um, and also miyuchasim. They have to have uh, this, the the... Uh, good yichus, good lineage. So therefore, the Gemara says, the Alpha Sanhedrin Dola Mi Sanhedrin Tana. And therefore, if there, where Yitro is telling him about the lower courts, means regarding the lower courts, there is this requirement that they should be like Moshe Rabbeinu, that they have to have good lineage, bringing the 23 person courts, and also be blemish free. So also regarding the Sanhedrin Dola Kalvachomer, they need to have those qualifications. And therefore, this Itach that the Rabbanan say, is brought here not to teach us that they have to have similar qualifications or pure lineage like Moshe, but rather that it's one unit, i.e. that the Sanhedrin Dola was 71 people and not, 20, and not uh, 70. Okay, <coughs> let's continue. Very interesting, I just want to point something out here, is that there does seem to be that there were two... Uh, steps in the selection of the Sanhedrin. There was back in Yitro where Moshe, uh, Yitro tells Moshe that he should appoint these lower courts. Now he is really referring to 23, etc. But then we have also, like, like we mentioned in Baalotecha, this is a different uh, setup, which is referring to what we call the Sanhedrin Dola. The Psukim there do say that the higher court, which was gathered seemingly of 70, was destroyed in Taveira, and that seems to be the, the subsequent reasoning or the prerequisite to the setting up of these courts. But this really seems to be the focal point, as the Rishonim explain, of this setup of the court of 71. That this is Baalotecha, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, if you want assistance, set up a court of 71. So now the Gemara moves on to the second section, and the Psukim there in Baalotecha teach us that there was a very interesting incident that occurred when they were when Moshe was attempting to set up this court. So the Gemara tells us that the Psukim say that Moshe gathered these elders and they were supposed to come with him to the Oil Moe. They were supposed to come with him and be imbued with the heavenly spirit as it was. Um, the, the spirit of the Ruach HaKodesh of Moshe was going to go on to these people and uh, they were able to have prophecy. That's the point. However, the Psukim there say two of these elders, which we'll see were Eldad, Eldad and Medad, they remained in the camp. So the Gemara says they remained in the camp and as we'll see, they prophesied. It's prophesied, I found that today, not prophesized. And they prophesied and the Gemara is going to show us exactly what happened in this incident. So the Gemara says like this. These two men. Eldad and Medad, who were of the original group, we'll see, that were perhaps going to be from this Sanhedrin, they remained in the camp. So we have two explanations as to what was going on. Yeshomrim. So there are those who explain, Bekalfinishtairu, that they remained literally means in the box. Now what does that mean? So in the box, it doesn't mean they stayed in the, in the uh, societally accepted standards. It means something else. Let's see. Because when HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Moshe, gather 70 men from the elders of Israel. So Amar Moshe, Moshe said like this, What should I do? Meaning, how should I proceed to gather these 70 Zekenim, to create this Sanhedrin? We have a, uh, a numbers issue here. See, we have 12 tribes. And each of the tribes is going to want that they have equal representation amongst these kenim. 
So he said like this, Ever shisham mikol shevet v'shevet, if I choose six zekenim from each of the tribes, the problem is six times 12 is going to be 72. There's going to be two extra. I need 70, I don't need 72. That's not going to work. If I choose five skenim from each of the tribes, the problem is that's only going to be 60. So then it's going to be lacking 10 from the number of 70. So Moshe said, then I'm only going to have 60 and not 70 as I'm instructed. Oh. So Evro Shisha Mishevet Zeb Chamisha Mishevet Zeh, if I choose six from one tribe and five from the other tribes, meaning really it means I choose six from ten of the tribes and five from two of the tribes, because six times ten would be sixty, five times two is ten, and then I'll have a total of seventy elders as I'm meant to do. The problem with that is that's imbalanced. Hareni Matil Kina bin Ashvatim. I'm going to create enmity, jealousy between the tribes, meaning that some the tribe who ends up having five skenim is going to get upset and say, well, what, why does the other tribe have six representatives on this Sanhedrin Dola, and I only have five? It's not fair. So Moshe Rabbeinu understood that it was necessary to do some sort of a process that would have a uh, divine element to it that showed this is how it's meant to be. So what happened? Masa, what did Moshe Rabbeinu do? Birer Moshe, Birer Shisha Shisha. He chose uh, six zkenim from each of the tribes. And he brought ve'evi shiv'im v'shnayim pitakin. So he brought these now 72 zkenim to an area. And he brought 72 pitakim. Pitakin are lots, or pieces of paper. So he brought 72 lots, or pieces of paper. Al shiv'im katav zaken. On 70 of them he wrote the word zaken, elder. V'shnayim heniach halak. And two of them he left blank. He mixed them together in a box. And Amar Lahem, he said to these kenim, these 72 kenim, Come and take your, your piece of paper, your lot. Any of these kenim that they, were, they took out in their hand a paper that said zaken. Amar kvar kidshecha shamayim. So Moshe Rabbeinu said, from shamayim you were sanctified, you were ordained to be part of the Sanhedrin. And Yishala biyado chalak, the one that chose the uh, the blank one, Amar Moshe said, amakom lo chafetz becha, Hashem does not uh, desire you, ani ma'aseh lecha, what could I do for you? So this way, what Moshe Rabbeinu did was, it was fair. Meaning this was like ordained by Shamayim to some degree. And the two who would ultimately, sorry, the, yeah, the two who would ultimately get the blank ones, those two were uh, not meant to be. Now, the Gemara doesn't explain what happened here. Because what do you mean, as we started off saying, these two, two Eldad and Medad remained in the camp, remained in the box. So Rashi elaborates a little more, as well as the Yad Ramah. He explains like this. According to this first opinion, what it means by Yisharu Bamachane, it means that these two, Eldad and Medad, they feared rejection. They feared they were going to pick out the ones that said on them, Chalak, that were, that were Chalak, that were blank. So therefore, they didn't even take the pieces of paper out. They just refrained from taking them out. And what's very interesting is that Rashi learns in this first shita, actually, they, the two that they should have chosen that remained in the box, these two pieces of paper, actually said zaken. So they were actually fitting to be skenim, to be part of the Sanhedrin, but they didn't choose based on fear of rejection. And because of that, they uh, just refrained because of their fear of rejection. They didn't... Uh, join the Sanhedrin as they could have. One second. Very interesting. That's how uh, the Mepharshim here explained. That's what it means, it remained in the box. It means they could have chosen two, the two that remained in there if they would have actually done a selection and taken from the box these lots, they would have actually been chosen, but they just were scared to be rejected, so they didn't choose. Interesting idea, exactly what that is. Okay, one second. Yeah. Okay, let's continue. This is the first shot in terms of what it means, they remained in the camp. It means they remained in the camp, they didn't choose these lots because of fear of being uh, dis disregarded. And therefore, they remained where they were. They didn't go with the other 70 to be part of the Sanhedrin. 
Now the Gemara on a tangentially tells us there was a similar system utilized at a different time in history. Now this is at a time in history, very interesting. After the Egel Azahav, the rights to serve in the Beit HaMikdash and the Mishkan was shifted from the Bechorim, the firstborns, to the Leviim. It means initially, actually, the firstborns were meant to be the, the Leviim or to serve in the Beit HaMikdash or in the Mishkan. Actually, we know with Esav, that was part of the reason that he was so comfortable to sell the Bechorat to Yaakov Avinu. Because he said, I know that the Bechorim, the firstborns, are going to service in the Beit HaMikdash, in the temple. And I also know that if you do the wrong thing in service, you don't have the right mentality and behaviors, you end up getting killed. I'm not interested in that. What happened was, after the Egel HaZahav, because the Bechorim, the firstborns, engaged in it, they forfeited, and Leviim, who stood with Moshe, against it, against the Egel, against the people who were involved in the Egel HaZahav. So they merited now to be uh, inducted into that service in place of the firstborns. In order to do this, though, there was a necessary exchange or deconsecration process that needed to take place. So what did that mean? It means, however many Bechorim there were, they had to deconsecrate themselves, transferring the Ketushav, serving in the temple, to the Leviim. Now, the Psukim tell us that there were 22,000 Leviim, and there were 22,273 Bechorim. So 22,000 of the Bechorim were able to just stand in front of Moshe and say, I deconsecrate myself, we transfer the Ketusha from the Bechor to the Levi without any other process. But the 270 firstborns that didn't have Levim corresponding to them, so they had to do, similar to Pidyon Ben, very interesting, they had to deconsecrate themselves by dedicating five Shkalim, five Shekel, to the uh, temple treasury. The thing is, nobody, none of the Bechorim wanted to be of that last group of 273. I'd rather not have to spend money and be involved in this process. It's easier for me just to deconsecrate without spending money like this. So as we'll see, there was also a lottery done to determine which 273 would have to engage in this process of deconsecration and which 22,000 would not. So the Gemara says, In a similar way, we find, this is in Bamidbar, at the end of Bamidbar, it says, You shall take five shekel per head of the 273. So a similar idea like this. Amar Moshe, Moshe said again, What should I do for the Israel, for the Jewish people? If I tell the random 273 or any of the 22,273, pay your money and go out. So any of those Bechorim will say, I've already been redeemed by a Ben Levi. means I'm part of the 22,000, not part of the 273. So Ma'asa, what Ma'asa, what did he do? He took two, 22,000 uh, pieces of paper, these parchment, these lots. And he wrote on them, the son of a Levi. And on 273 pieces of paper, parchment, he wrote uh, five, five shkalim. Again, he mixed them together, all these 22,273 pieces of paper, and he put them in a box. And he said to the 22,273 firstborns, Take your uh, pieces of paper, your lots. Misha labiado ben Levi, and the one who was who chose ben Levi, Marlok far padacha ben Levi. You've already been redeemed mina shamayim by a ben Levi. You don't have to worry about paying for your redemption. Misha labiado chamesh shkalim, and the one who took out of the other two hundred seventy-three that said five five shkalim, Marlo tem pejon chavitze. So you do have to pay your value and then be redeemed. So this is all the first shot in terms of what happened with. Uh, El Dada Meidad is that they were fearful of redemption. They didn't take out the lots for like they were supposed to, and they remained in the camp and didn't go along with the rest of the Sanhedrin. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Rabbi Shimon says a second pshat in terms of the, the nature of this Vayish Aru Machana. Rabbi Shimon says Bamachana Nishtairu, they remained in the camp. What does it mean? When HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, I want you to gather 70 men for the newly created Sanhedrin, so Amru Eldad Meidad, Eldad Meidad said, Ein anu la We are not fitting for this greatness. They were humble. This was humility. They said, we are not fitting to be part of this new great assembly and we, we will refrain. So this was actually an act of humility, not a refraining because of rejection. So Amara Kadosh Baruch Hu Hashem said, 
Since you lowered yourselves, you, you're humble. I am going to add greatness onto your greatness. And what greatness did HaKadosh Baruch Hu add on to Eldam and Medad? Because the other 70 of this newly created Sanhedrin, their prophecy, which did happen, it was only for that time, but then it stopped after. But their prophecy, Eldad and Medad, it continued, it did not stop. So this is according to Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon says, not like the Tanakama, that they were fearful of, re fearful of rejection, but rather, out of humility, they said, we don't want to be part of this newly uh, minted Sanhedrin now on the level, and therefore HaKadosh Baruch Hu actually rewarded them, because you're so humble, you're going to get even greater than the rest of the other 70, and your, you'll, your prophecies will continue, your prophecies will continue, whereas theirs did not. And we'll see the source for that after this next piece. So the Gemara continues and says, What was the prophecy they were saying? Because as the Psukim there imply, and we'll get more into it momentarily, that Eldad and Medad started to prophesy, and Yoshua, who was a student of Moshe, went to Moshe Rabbeinu and said, they're prophesying in the camp and it's inappropriate. Moshe said, Halavai, they should all be prof prophets. It means everyone should prophesy. But the Gemara wants to know, what was it that they were saying? So there's three answers. What were they actually saying? So the first pshat, Amru, they were saying, Moshe met, that Moshe is going to die. Yoshua machnit Yitzrael Aretz, and Yoshua will bring the Jewish people into Eretz Yisrael. And this is actually true. That is what ended up happening. But as you can imagine, Yoshua didn't very much appreciate them talking about his Rebbe, Moshe Rabbeinu, like this. That's the first pshat. Abachanin Omer Abachanin said, Mishum Rebbe Yezer, and they were Yezer, Al Iske Slav Hein Mitnav Im. They were actually prophesying, as it implies in the Torah, the next episode is about the Slav. The Jews were complaining that they didn't have meat in the desert, and the next episode was Hashem brought these fatty birds. I think Arsul translates them as quail. So <clears throat> Eldad and Medad prophesied, 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 I'm confused about that, about those Slav that were going to be brought to the Jewish people before they came. They were saying, Ali Slav, Ali Slav, that the birds should come up, the birds will come up, means they were prophesying about that future event. Rav Nachman, Amr Rav Nachman, the third pshat, he says, Al iske gog magog hayu mitnavin. They were prophesying about the matters of Gog and Magog. Now Gog and Magog, this is Gog is a king from Magog, is a place who in the end of days, as, as it's called in English, is Armageddon, will be when the uh, there will be this great war at the end of days and he'll fight against the Jewish people and Hashem will save us. So that's what Rav Nachman says that uh, Eldad and Medad were prophesying about. Now, the other two pshatim, they seem to fit in the context as we'll explain. That he was, they were prophesying about Moshe's demise, Yeshua taking over, or as I explained, the next episode is about the Slav. It makes sense that the way that, that's what they were talking about. But according to this third pshat, Rav Nachman, it seems to be completely out of place. So what's the source then that they were prophesying about this event in the end of days. Shneamar, as the Pasuk tells us in Yechezkel, Ko amar Hashem Elohim, so says Hashem, Ha'ata hu, are you the one, asher dibarti bayamim kadmonim, that I spoke about you in the earlier days, biyad avdin neviyei Yisrael, in the hands of my servants, the prophets of Israel, hanib'im, that prophesied, bayamim ahem shanim, that they prophesied in the early days and years, to bring you, means Gog and Magog, against the Jewish people, etc. So the Gemara says, even though it says Shanim, in earlier years, it could also be read Shnaim. So what does it mean? I'll take re, shani, Shanim, not in the earlier years, Ela Shnaim, but rather that there were two people who prophesied the same information about Gog and Magog. Ve'ezohen, who are these two? Who Shnaim shen nevi'im she'it nabu v'perek echad nevu'achat. Where else do we find, says the Gemara, Rav Nachman, that there was two prophets, there were two prophets who prophesied at the same time about the same information. This is referring to Eldad and Meidad. So therefore, says Rav Nachman, we find here this reference in Pasuk and Yechezkel that the two prophets, Eldad and Meidad, had prophesied already about this future event of Gog and Magog. Beautiful. Now, according to this Brayta that we were quoting, we said that the Zichut, according to Rabbi Shimon, because they were humble and thought they weren't fitting to be part of the Sanhedrin, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave them greatness that their prophecies continued unlike the rest of the Sanhedrin. So the Gemara says, where do we find a source for this? 
Amar Marko Nevi'im Kulan Nitnavu Pasku, Vehe Nitnavu Velo Pasku. So everyone else, their prophecies stopped, but the Eldad and Meidad, they continued to prophesy. So the Gemara Zimanal and the Pasku, where do we know that the other 70, they only prophesied for that time, but not beyond that time? Ilema, maybe you'll say it's based on the Pasuk there. Because it says, It says, they prophesied. Now, as we'll see, it could either mean it did not continue, or it could mean it didn't stop. So if you'll say the Pshad is, it means by the 70, it says they prophesied, and it didn't, the way you'll translate it is, didn't continue. The problem with saying that is, we find by Matan Torah, it says, It says that the voice of Hashem, of the Shekhinah, at Har Sinai was a great voice. Now, if you translate Velo Yasaf means it didn't continue. Hachinami Delo Osifu doesn't mean it didn't continue. Obviously, it doesn't mean that means the, uh, the opposite, actually. The Psukim are emphasizing that this great voice continued by the Shechina of Hashem. Ella, so obviously, says the Gemara, really what it means is Delo Pasaku. It means it didn't stop, the opposite Pshat. And therefore, you can't bring that as a source that the 70s, their prophecies, didn't uh, didn't uh, continue because really you see the word yasaf or yasafu means that it didn't stop. So rather the Gemara says It's based on the context of the distinction between the way that they prophesied. That regarding the seventy, it says vayitnabu, which is in the past tense. They prophesied, meaning in the past. And hatam regarding eldar and meidat ktiv, it says mitnabim. They are prophesying, meaning they're continuing to prophesy in the camp. Their prophecies are continuing. So therefore, based on that distinction, you see that Eldad and Medad's continued as opposed to the 70, their prophecies ceased after this incident. Now the Gemara analyzes. Let's take a look exactly at these three shitot. Again, we have three opinions as to what was the nature, what was the content of the prophecy here. The first opinion we said was Eldad and Medad were prophesying that Moshe would die, Yeshua would take the Jews into Eretz Yisrael. The second shita, Abachanin, in the name of Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Lezer, he said they were uh, prophesying about the Slav, which is the next incident in the Torah. These fatty birds that would be brought because the Jews complained about not having meat. And the third shot was Rav Nachman, he said that the these two prophets were prophesying about Gog and Magog. So the like Gemara's met. I understand, according to the first shita, that they were prophesying about Moshe's death. So that's why it says in the Psukim there, Yoshua heard, and he ran to Moshe, and it says, Adoni Moshe kilaim. He says to Moshe, my master Moshe, destroy them. He got upset. Destroy these people because they're prophesying about your demise. But according to the other two shitot that they were prophesying about the Slav or Gog or Magog, my Adoni Moshe kilaim. Why would he have said, destroy them? They didn't testify. They didn't uh, prophesy about anything inappropriate. The Gemara answer is, it's not Derech Eretz. Why not? Very interesting. There's an Isur, we discussed earlier in the Masechta actually, for a student to paskin a halacha in place of his master. We learned over there that you have to be a certain distance, if I remember correctly, three parsa away, at least in order to paskin a halacha if you're in the, the region of your Rebbe. So Yeshua is upset, Bichlal, that they're prophesying in place of Moshe Rabbeinu, where he exists, that's considered inappropriate, so he was saying they should be destroyed. Now the Gemara flips it. Bishlama Hanach Tarti, according to the second and third shitot, that they were prophesying about either the Slav or Gogo Magog. So I understand why Moshe's response is, meet and he says, Halavai, they should all prophesy, the whole camp should prophesy. But according to the first shita, that the prophecy was that Moshe is going to die. What kind of a response is that? Moshe would have been happy that they're prophesying that he's going to die. Is even if you say it was Moshe, Moshe was anav mikol adam. He was the most humble. The contents of this prophecy has a very negative implication towards him. So why would he have said, I wish everyone would prophesy, as if to imply he's happy with this. So the Gemara answers, Lo saimua kamei. That what happened was Yeshua presented what they were saying, but he hadn't finished his sentence till Moshe said, Halavai, they should all prophesy. If he would have heard that the, the content of the prophecy, he wouldn't have been very excited about it either. So the Gemara says, What did Yeshua mean when he said, destroy them? So the Gemara explains it doesn't mean that he was saying actually physically destroy them. Rather, Rather, place on them, 
duties of the public, means place on Eldad and Medad the uh, authority that they have to take care of the tzibur, and they will be destroyed by themselves. Now the simple pshat in the Gemara means Yeshua ben Nun was telling Moshe, they're prophesying about you, which is something negative that I don't appreciate. And because of that, place on them the burdens of the public and people who take on public responsibilities naturally, like stress kills, meaning they'll, they'll be destroyed naturally. Tosafot learns differently. He says a tremendous idea here. He says, Yoshua wasn't asking for them to be physically destroyed, but rather, if you place on them the burdens of the public, they won't be in a state of joy. They'll be in a state of sadness. Unbelievable. And you can't have shechina, you can't have a prophecy when you're in a state of sadness or a state of stress. And then naturally their prophecy will, will, will come to a halt. And that's what Yeshua is saying. The prophecies, which I'm not appreciating, will come to a halt and will no longer continue. Either way you learn, it's a very interesting idea, is that this idea, uh, public office is something, as the Gemara tells us here, it tells us in many places, we find with Mordechai Tzadik actually, that after he even saved the Jewish people, nonetheless, it says he was only Ratzoy Rov Echav. We just did the Gemara uh, in Mesechet Megillah, towards the end of the first parak. Ratzoy Rov Echav, that the Sanhedrin, some of them separated from him because once he took positions of authority, he wasn't learning as much Torah. There is a certain detriment that naturally comes along with positions of authority. Even if it's necessary, it's still something that is difficult in that way. We're going to stop here at the bottom of Yudzayin Amud Aleph. We'll pick up tomorrow, God willing, with Yudzayin Amud Bet, with Minayin Lavi Od Shlosha, which is towards the bottom of Yudzayin Amud Aleph, and we'll, God willing, turn to Yudzayin Amud Bet too. But in the meantime, I wish everybody a wonderful day and all the best.